As I said last week, we forget what a superstar healer and miracle worker Jesus was back in his day. And we forget how exciting and dangerous his mission turned out to be. The gospel, according to Mark, is really an action-packed drama. From the moment that wild-eyed John the Baptist appears in the wilderness to the exciting conclusion when the women run away in fear from the open, empty tomb, afraid to say anything to anyone. Mark chapter 1, verse 1, even provides an exciting headline for what follows. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark doesn't waste time, as the other Gospels do, with birth stories or genealogies. From the very beginning in Mark, Jesus and his disciples are on the move all over Galilee and in the provinces beyond. As Sally began today's reading, then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. It's hard, I think, to get a grip on all those place names unless you bring your Bible map with you to church each Sunday. If you want to put it on a map, we might understand. It's as if the disciples walked from here, if we were in Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee or Candlewood Lake, up to Silver Lake when they go up to Tyre to escape the crowds on retreat. But then when we read they return by way of Sidon, it would be like returning here by way of Torrington. It wasn't exactly on the way. In fact, they had to go farther north before they came back. They were making a circuit of the entire area and gathering followers with them wherever they went. Word spreads so fast about Jesus that he often, we read in Mark, gets up before dawn to slip off by himself in the wilderness to pray. And when the crowds catch up with him, he and the disciples go on the run once again. We can see why Jesus in Mark is always telling these happy people that he has just healed to tell no one. Bible scholars like to call this the messianic secret. It's a paradox. The good news, tell no one. But in many ways, in this context, we can see it's just common sense. If everywhere he goes, Jesus picks up more desperate followers, sick with diseases and disabilities or with mentally disturbed or terminally ill family members, it's got to be a difficult road he walks. At times, we read Jesus is nearly crushed by the crowds. And besides that, his success makes him a marked man to the authorities back down in Jerusalem, about like New York City is to us. So he was wise to keep a low profile while out in the provinces, at least at first. Jesus needed his mission to stay a secret so that he could survive to preach another day. So that's one reason Jesus orders people he heals to tell no one. And since the man whose tongue he loosened in that first story literally could not keep his mouth shut, in the second story, Jesus more firmly warns the blind man, do not even go back into town. Presumably if he did, even if he didn't tell, the people there would remember that the man they knew had been blind just a little while before. So Mark's good news of Jesus Christ was arguably Galilee's worst kept secret. But what I want to know is why is it that the good news of Jesus Christ, as we know it here in our church, why is it that sometimes this good news seems to be Brookfield's best kept secret? 
I'm always running into people who, in town, will say, yes, I drive by your church all the time. Didn't know what happened inside. <laughs> and I think we aren't telling folks the good news about what happens inside our walls as loudly as we might, because like the deaf, mute, and blind men that Jesus here healed, I think we sometimes don't hear and see the wonders of our ministries as well as we might. Jesus spat on those people and touched them, but I'm wondering how Christ as we know him can heal our blind eyes, our deaf ears, and our mute tongues today. I'm thinking that maybe we need to allow ourselves to define healing in some new ways, less literal ways, perhaps, than the ones familiar to us in our modern age of x-rays and chemotherapy and open heart surgery. I had a good example of how this might work in my last church. When I began my ministry there, we had this one older member who had worked his entire career as a research chemist. So you can imagine he was a well-educated thinking man, a thoughtful Christian and lifelong church goer and committee member. He and his wife had one son who, after he had moved to the Bible Belt, joined a fundamentalist megachurch that taught him that his parents, as members of our United Church of Christ, were not really Christians. So when I went to see them for the first time, the father, who I'll call Frank, was already very sick in his late 80s and in hospice care for cancer. His wife, who I'll call Irma, Irma was caring for him, but mostly she was trying to make peace every day between this stubborn born-again son and his equally stubborn father. The son, who I'll call David, began preaching at me the moment I arrived, and he didn't stop even when it was time for him to show me the door. So before I, before I went out, I stopped for a moment and said, would you like me to lead us first in a brief word of prayer? And he looked a little taken aback, but he did get quiet, and um, he joined hands with me and Irma as we prayed around Frank's bedside. And in that prayer, basically, I just asked Jesus to be close to us and to support Frank and his family in the days to come. I admit it wasn't much of a prayer, but David couldn't wait to begin critiquing it on the way to the door. He um, let me know that my theology was all wrong, that I should have been praying for a complete and absolute cure, a miracle, and also that I should have really been praying, most importantly, that his father should accept Jesus Christ into his heart as his personal Lord and Savior before it was too late. <laughs> 